You know, he had this woman uh, in the uh, novels over and over and over <clears throat> that was a murderess and an adulteress, and they were all based on me. <laughs> <laughs> these novels of the 60s. And I, I did find that a little disturbing. And then Confessions of a Crap Artist, which he wrote on our honeymoon. I mean, I read that and I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know what to say because it's a portrait of this woman that I didn't feel was me, but she, she wore my clothes. <laughs> she had my appearance. It, you know, it was a halfway autobiographical book. Somebody said that book should have been a warning to you. I don't want to play amateur psychologist, but I think she was part of a dream that failed to come true. That dream that he had of being with Anne on his elbow and signing autographs at the big bookstores in New York, that never came true. And it was really hard for him to accept that. What happened was that we were we fought a lot and yelled and I threw things. And then we were both going to a, a psychiatrist who my first husband had gone to um, for marriage therapy. And Philip just charmed that psychiatrist. He thought Philip was, he, he loved him. He was not in love with him. He wasn't gay or anything, but he loved him. And so Philip wove his little web. And the next thing I know, the sheriff came and took me off to the mental hospital. You know, I think he just said your mother needs help, you know, she needs to go someplace where she can get help. But obviously, we lived in a small town, an ambulance came to get her. At that time when you were committed, it was against your will and you no had no say. For me, it was just totally crushing. I mean, it was a terrible stigma, even though it was a sort of an interesting experience. However, my mother could act pretty crazy and he act just as crazy, so they probably both should have been there together. And uh, Philip kept saying, it's me who's nuts. <laughs> I'm the one that should be in there. Well, maybe that was true. Uh, my mother's really eccentric, a really strong person, and liked to have her way. He was a really strong person and had his very strong beliefs and ideas. But I know that when they were having a disagreement, like, you wanted to run and hide because it was like, the house was going to fall down. And then he start, started running off and going to, uh, he, going to stay at his mother's. And then he'd come back, or I'd go get him, and he'd come back. And he must have come back and run off about 17 times. He, he was going through a period of great turmoil. And he was teetering back and forth. He was on the phone with Ann. He was off the phone. He was calling her a grunk. And then he was rhapsodizing about how sophisticated she was. And finally, he phoned her and said he wanted to be reconciled with her. Would she come to Oakland? So she said, sure, I'll come. And she came. Anne turns up at the front door. Phil pulls a revolver and said, go away. Go away. I never want to see you again. And Anne runs away and cries. He, he had this little gun, he was pointing at me. It was very frightening. He says that, that he was having the ner major nervous breakdown of his life later on. But I think also he felt like he was a danger to me and the, the girls. And that was really maybe the main reason that he left. He, he condemned himself, sort of. I was very angry at him for a long time. I don't know if I hated him. No, I don't think I hated him. I was angry at him for leaving me. It's a terrible thing to do to your wife and children. You know, I mean, it really, everyone was very hurt. He met a family, Hackett, I believe that was their name, and he formed a, a, a big crush on the elder of two sisters. But the elder of the two sisters thought he was nuts and wouldn't have anything to do with him. So he, uh, as a second choice, he took Nancy Hackett and married her. Nancy, oh. <laughs> Nancy came out here with her. She was 19 years old. She came out here with her, her stepmother, who was our friend. <clears throat> from from St. Columbus Church, a very brilliant woman. Uh, 
And later on, Nancy was, he was going to marry Nancy. 64, 65, the woman of the hour is Nancy, who had just been discharged from a mental hospital. He describes her as scared, brittle, 21, and schizophrenic. Um, she became pregnant. He married her. He's 19 years old, didn't say anything, didn't do anything. I don't know whether she was on some kind of drugs or, or what, but she, she, you know, she had a very hard life, very difficult life. She had a real mental illness. In July 1966, Philip K. Dick marries Nancy Hackett. While living in San Rafael, their daughter Isolde is born. With a growing religious interest, he forms a close relationship with Bishop James Pike of the Episcopal Church. He was in the process, along with the rest of the Bay Area, of searching for a new religion. He and, and Jim Pike, the bishop, they were both looking for something that even unbelievers can believe in. I think that Phil got a lot of his ideas about religion from Bishop Pike, and Pike had a lot of unorthodox ideas. Jim Pike was, you know, on the cover of Time magazine and, you know, very significant, you know, big connection with the anti-war movement and things like this. Bishop Pike was uh, tried for heresy himself for trying to prove that Jesus did not die on the cross. Jim was in, in deep trouble with his church for that. And then I guess it was 1966 that he quit the church or was forced out, depending on how you look at it, because of being too heretical. Phil knew him so that he knew personal things about, about Jim Pike. He knew about Jim Pike's mistress, that Jim Pike paid out of the uh, bishop's discretionary fund, uh, you know, the apartment where uh, she lived and things like this. And he was getting very heretical at that point because the thing between Phil and him was Phil had this idea of an evil God. And Jim had this idea of a good God. And then Jim's son committed suicide. What kind of a universe is it when the bishop's son, the bishop's son, kills himself? Is Phil right? Is there really an evil God? just waiting to destroy us. I, in my stories and novels, often write about counterfeit worlds, semi-real worlds, as well as deranged private worlds, inhabited often by just one person, while meantime, the other characters either remain in their own worlds throughout or are somehow drawn into one of the peculiar ones. This theme occurs in the corpus of my 27 years of writing. At no time did I have a theoretical or conscious explanation for my preoccupation with these pluriform pseudo-worlds, but now I think I understand. What I was sensing was the manifold of partially actualized realities lying tangent to what evidently is the most actualized one, the one which the majority of us, by consensus gentium, agree on. It was his karma that the world was stacked against him and um, that uh, if he could be put into an embarrassing position, fate would put him there. I think what I was most um, sensitive about the fact was that he'd gone off on this um, trajectory of sort of, I thought it was sort of self-destructive because when he was in our family home, he was had family dinners and went to church and sort of had a, a semblance of a, a more average life. And then he just went off on this trajectory of um, sort of extreme behavior. Nancy had a lot of uh, friends who were involved in drugs.